<laughs> Good evening and welcome to Legacy After the Locker Room. I'm your host, Caleb Bradham, here tonight with an amazing treat. We have Jim, the rookie Morris, and his lovely wife, Shauna. Welcome to the show, you guys. Thank, thank you. you, Caleb. Glad to be here. Thank you. And, and first of all, thank you so much for being here. But let's go right in because everybody's going to be saying, what about the Disney movie? And, you know, tell me about that surgery and the Milwaukee Brewers. So I'm from Milwaukee. So everybody's looking at 1983 Brewers right after the World Series. Yeah. But Jim, let's talk a little bit about um, growing up with a love for baseball. Um, anybody who's seen the movie she sees a little boy dad traveling around in the military. What's your story, Jim? My story is I was born with asthma. Within 24 hours, I had pneumonia. I was never supposed to get out of the hospital. My father was physically and verbally abusive. So a sports field is where I found home. And it didn't matter what sport it was, I wanted to do it. You know, track, basketball, football, and especially baseball. We lived on the West Coast when Vita Blue played, and you have to be as old as I am to remember who Vita Blue was, but he was amazing. I tried to pitch like him. It didn't work out too well. Then we moved to the East Coast, and we lived in Connecticut, and I wanted to be Louis Tiant, who pitched for the Red Sox, and I couldn't replicate his either, but I had to be the best me I could. And, you know, people talk about overcoming obstacles all the time, but when you're too scared to be in your own house, you will do anything you can to get out. And fortunately for me, I had a great respite in, in sports. And so in between the white lines, I talk in my speeches, in between the white lines, I could be the kid I was supposed to be if for only a few hours at a time. So that resonates with me. Um, a lot of our uh, sports philanthropy community has heard my story. I grew up severely physically, sexually, emotionally abused, left for dead multiple times. And it really is finding an outlet. So um, usually I would ask a few more follow-up questions, but I think it's real important that we just stop here, Jim. And as a kid who's gone through it, and as a science teacher, as parents, both of you, five children, Let's take just a moment here and talk about words of wisdom for trauma survivors who haven't found the courage yet to tell somebody or maybe don't even know who they can trust to tell somebody. Guys, for those people right from the beginning, what's the word of wisdom, word of advice for them? I think that there is always hope. And you have to have grace on yourself because a lot of people who are abused turn that inward and blame themselves. And that is not, that's not our fault. It happened to us. We didn't cause it. And so to be able to turn around and go, I'm going to fight my way out of this. I've been a fighter my whole life. I wasn't supposed to play sports. I did. Uh, never thought I would get out of the house. My mom and I talked probably two years ago about my father, who's now deceased. And I said, you know, mom, I thought he wanted to kill me. And she goes, he did. And it was brutal. He was holding my little brother one day. He looks down at me and he goes, this is the one we wanted. We never wanted you. And you will do anything you can to find a way out. And for me, it was sports. And I would say somebody needs to find their niche, whether it's arts, music, whatever that niche is, go out and be the best you you can be and leave all the other stuff. Let it go away for a little bit. And the more you do that, the more it will fade. But for me, uh, dream makers and surrounding yourself with the best to be your best. Fortunately for me, my parents did me the biggest favor at 15. They never knew they did. They moved me from Miami, Florida in their house to my grandparents' house in Brownwood, Texas. And it was my grandparents who saved me. You got to find those people who are going to lift you up and not tear you down. I couldn't agree more. So. Thank you, first of all. And let's let's go back then to the baseball story, seeing that it was your outlook uh, outlet. Tell us a little bit about how you made your college selection. Was that a scholarship ride? <laughs> no, ma'am. My high school, when we got to Texas, I was a, the second freshman to ever make the varsity team in, in Florida. Two weeks after the season starts, they moved me to my grandparents' house, which I love because I love my grandparents. But our high school had no baseball because the football coach who was in the high school hall of fame for wins and state championships hated baseball. And so I played football. I ran track. I played basketball. 
I got seen by some guy who showed up at a summer league game. We played like 10 games a summer. If you win, you play a few more. It was a major league scout and he, all of major leagues. So he was a major scout and he saw me and the day he showed up, I struck out 17 people and hit three home runs. And to top that off, the last time up, I strike out, right? And so my father had retired, moved back by then because I was 18. And he goes, you're never going to make it anywhere because you struck out. And behind him is the major league scout. And then there is a junior college coach. And this whole period I'm going through this summer, I'm watching my grandfather, who was the mentor of my life, fight ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. And so I didn't want to go anywhere. I wanted to stay close to home. And Ranger was 45 minutes away. My coach knew my grandparents. Everybody knew my grandparents in Texas. And he knew everybody. And so to be able to do that, he said, you come play baseball for me. I'll get you classes that you can pass. But on the weekends, you go home and you spend time with your grandparents. And that's what I did in the fall of 1982. Super cool. Super cool. So... I guess, you know, we got to talk a little bit about the movie. Um, I'm sure it's done wonders for your family. Feedback thoughts on the movie itself and, and family life and sort of where it's taking you now. But before we do that, let's just remind our listeners, this is the Legacy After the Locker Room podcast. We're powered by the Sports Philanthropy Network. We're here today with Jim and Shauna Morris, Jim the Rookie. And to our listeners, first of all, just thank you for watching. Thank you for your support. There's been so much social media buzz about this podcast in particular. So Jim and Shauna, first of all, on behalf of the Legacy After the Locker Room community, thank you for creating hope and possibility through sports. Mm-hmm. What about the movie? Thank you. You're welcome. The movie. Um, I was on the set every day when Dennis got the, the job. I went over to Dennis Quaid's house and played catch with him in his front yard. And I thought, this is pretty cool. And he told me right then, he goes, if you see anything being filmed that you don't agree with, you tell me and it's out. And and he was true to his word. He and I got along so well. I was on the set almost the whole time. We would film all day and then we would go eat and then he would play with his band in one of the bars on 6th Street and I would go watch them play. And it was just a lot of fun. I. I would look at him and go, you are like 10 years older than me and you have all this energy. Where does it come from? He goes, Red Bull. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> Sports Philanthropy Network and Legacy After the Locker Room proudly support both Disney Channel and Red Bull. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's talk a little bit, if you guys don't mind, um, what life was like, Jim, playing baseball having children, Um, you know, I think a lot of our professional athletes and especially our minor league athletes coming from other countries in particular can really relate to what it's like to leave your family behind to number one, pursue your dreams, number two, hopefully to put food on the dinner table. How did that impact you guys? I, I will tell you this, everybody talks because everybody wants to hear the dirt, right? I was at Fenway Park and I watched 23 other guys out talking to their kids on the phone after one of our games before we got on the bus to go to New York. And you know what? There are so many good stories in baseball and I would love to share so much with you, but we do not have 48 hours. And one day, Roberto Hernandez, my best friend, the big leagues, he wakes me up and I'm like, dude, it's 6 a.m. We don't have to be the park till one. He goes, come on, we're going to breakfast. But it wasn't breakfast. He took me down the street in Manhattan and he knocks on the door. He reaches through the bars, knocks on a door. This guy opens up his glass door, pulls back the bars, takes me in and sizes me for shirts and suits and shoes and socks and belts, tailored it. And it was in my room, in the closet, hanging after the game that night. It was unbelievable. And, but there are stories like that all over baseball. And, you know, those are stories I want people to hear because these guys, oh, they're just, they're pampered. They, they just want money. You know what? If you can get paid silly money to go play a kid's game, that's pretty cool. You have to be really good to be able to do that. But the stories were amazing. And I missed my kids. 
And I'd never been away from home. I'm a teacher and a coach. And so a weekend away for our baseball tournament in high school is one thing. Being away for months is really, really hard. And so I feel for a lot of these guys because their hearts are with their families. And I, that's what I want to see. I want to see, I want to see men be men and stand up and be the leaders in their families they need to be. And I want them to nurture their kids and, and usher in their dreams. My father told me I would never make it in baseball. My football coach told me I would never make it in baseball. And for a long time, I didn't because everything was about me. And it took a kid, a group of kids from West Texas to show me who, when I pushed them, they pushed back. It became more about we than it became about me. And so I have kids everywhere. I don't have just my kids. I've got kids all over. And so they're still in contact with me. And it's just kids are our future. And I think we look at them and we go, they don't know anything. And you know what? Yeah, they do. You're never too old or too young to dream. That's uh, that's the whole message of everything that I'm trying to do is to create hope and possibility. And I think you just nailed it on the head. You're never too old to dream. So, I, you know, I, I got to come back to the idea when you say, like, I was a coach and a teacher. Just. Curious minds want to know, fun fact, why science, right? Like, just tell us a little bit about that story and, and why you chose that career path. I don't know that I actually chose science as much as science chose me. I was told how dumb I was forever. The night after we win the football state championship in high school, I take the SAT test. The scores come back, and my counselor is giggling as he looks at my scores, and he goes, what are you going to do with your life? And I said, I'm going to play baseball. And he goes, I hope so. You're too stupid to go to college. And then when I went back to college, the first class I took, first course was anatomy and physiology during the summer. And Dr. Ross stands up in front of the class the first day and he goes, why do you guys do this to yourselves? And then in our first test, and there's 19 registered nurses in there and there's me. And so he go, gives us our first test, class is over, he keeps me. He hands me back my test and he goes, you need to go to medical school. And I said, but I'm dumb. And he goes, your answers are better than the questions I ask. You need to go to medical school. And that one dream maker saying that one thing to me, honors fraternity. And school was a breeze then. And I had somebody believe in me and I just took off. And so science is what I gravitated to. And I would have gone to medical school, but kids got in the way. And I thought, you know what? I was taught the wrong way to do things so much in baseball. If I can get in and teach kids how to play the right way, that would mean everything to me. And so science teacher, baseball coach, which is funny because when I get to Big Lake, our IT teacher is next door to me and she comes over to introduce herself the first day of class and she goes, I don't like you. I'm like, wow. She goes, you're a coach and all you care about is winning. You know who the first letter I got was from in AAA? IT teacher. She goes, you have taught these kids more than any of us ever have out of a book. And you turn people around when they see, because I challenge the kids, they challenge back. She saw this every single day. And I made my kids do their homework. I made the kids turn it in. I made the kids open the door for teachers. I made them say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. And they lived up to that. And I think that's one of the big things we look at. You can live up to expectation or you can live down to expectation. That choice is yours. I want people to live up here. We can do so much more than what we think we're capable of. We just quit a little too early. Fantastic. Now, I got to tell you guys, my children and I um, had family movie la night last night. And we watched The Rookie. And my 21-year-old daughter, who, by the way, is getting her Bachelor of Science um, to go into nursing or physician's assistant or something like that. So she she's a fan of yours, by the way. But Shauna, one of the comments that she made was, well, it never really says what the wife does. Um, tell us a little bit about your career path. Do you mind? No, not at all. If you're referring to the wife in the movie, that's not me. <laughs> um, Jimmy and Lori divorced when the movie was being made. And Disney decided to proceed with the movie. And we're so glad they did because it's such a wonderful product and has just been a huge success over 20 years, yeah. close to 20 years, 20 years next year. Um, 
but we actually met and we married the end of the year that the movie came out, the end of 2002. On a blind date. On a blind date, yeah. I mean, so everybody go on those blind dates. You never know what the other people, you know, trying to get you together might see in one another. Um, my career path, I have a bachelor's of science in business administration, and I own the business that we operate. And so I am his wife, but also his manager. <laughs> and a fantastic manager, by the way. Let's let, let me just if for anybody who's looking, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you guys a shameless plug that's very heartfelt. For anybody who is looking to hire Jim as a motivational speaker, whether it's for your corporate business, whether it's for your school, whether it's for your sports society. Mm -hmm. In my working with Shauna, setting up this podcast and, and explaining to her that I had a funeral last week and different That's things right. that were going on, um, your business is run phenomenally well with a heart for customer service. And I think that's really important to know. So everybody out there, go get Jim as your speaker. Thank you. <laughs> so you can talk to Shauna. <laughs> he'll talk to me, but then he'll talk to you. <laughs> that's right. That's right. The gatekeeper. So speaking about your business and the things that you're doing now, you know, there is the motivational speaking. And that's so critical because we live in a society, COVID hurts so many people, number one. And I'm so thankful that we now have this opportunity to do virtual and hybrid and teachers learn so many things about how to use technology. That was maybe one of the best things that came out of this, mm -hmm. but it's the motivational speaking. But Jim, you're also involved in a lot of philanthropic events. You've written a book. I want to talk a little bit in depth about the philanthropy because I have really have a heart for that. Before we do that, let's talk about the book. I'm going to put it up here on the screen. Dream makers, surround yourself with the best to be your best. Tell oh, forward by Dennis Quaid, by the way. There's the book. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, what's the inspiration for writing it? When did you write it? And how can people get a hold of it? Man, for the first 15 years, we looked for an ending because inevitably after I speak, I do question and answer sessions, which Shauna loves because people ask me stuff and I am blunt. Okay, we'll put it that way. I'm black <laughs> and white. And so I'll be honest with them. And I never had an ending for it. And uh, God gave us two. And so chapter nine is a very important chapter for me because I found myself in rehab at the age of 52 fighting Parkinson's, fighting pain pills and fighting vodka, and do not remember the week of Christmas in 2016. And first time in my life I ever went somewhere and for 30 days, I concentrated on me. And I had so many different things that I needed to fix in my life that I was carrying all this baggage. I needed to get rid of it. Chapter 10 is the faith chapter. And, um, the feather on the front of the book kind of alludes to that. And there's a reason for that. It was an incredible period of time when we had my girls from church praying for us. And my girls are 50 to 90, right? And they don't want to be called ma'am and they don't want to be called women. They're my girls. And they prayed for me constantly. I went to rehab. I never detoxed. I'm watching everybody else get sick. I never had anything. And I get out of there. And my mom buys me a cane to walk around the block because Parkinson's is tearing me down. All my doctors are going, it's just going to get worse. This is just what it does. Can't taste, can't smell. I like had COVID 25 years ago and <laughs> nothing is working on my body. And I'm trying to fight as hard as I can. Thankfully, I have my wife who knew what I needed to do and where I needed to go. And, um, it was probably one of the hardest things we've ever experienced and gone through. Yeah. Absolutely terrifying and then absolutely necessary to take the steps to save his life. And when I, I called our family doctor and I was like, here's what's going on. I mean, he overdosed last night. He confused his pills and I didn't manage his medicine. He was, he was capable. Um, but the pain was so bad. He ended up adding his own, 
<laughs> prescription of vodka on top of the medication, <laughs> which of course we know we should never do, but and now um, it's Dr. Pepper. <laughs> yes, praise the Lord. Dr. <laughs> Pepper, proud sponsor. <laughs> right. I'm trying to add something lighthearted to this serious conversation because I'll be honest with you guys, it's something that in my work with professional athletes, I deal with quite a bit. In my work with students, I deal with quite a bit. In my work as a Christian counselor. I deal with quite a bit like, you know, I think there's things that we can't sweep under the rug. Um, and this is just a great time to go back um, a, a year or two ago to uh, Daryl Jackson from the Minnesota Twins pitcher came on the podcast, shared his story of drug and alcohol addiction, gave out his personal phone number to anybody struggling wow. with addiction who needs help. So I just want to let our listeners know that if you're struggling, if you need help, if you need to talk to somebody about a friend, a family member, or a loved one, um, either talk to somebody you trust, there's no shame in the game, talk to a coach, talk to a friend, parent, family member, somebody at church, talk to somebody. And if you feel like there's nobody you can talk to, go back, find Daryl Jackson on the Legacy After the Locker Room podcast, find his number and give the guy a call. That's awesome. Yeah, incredible. So we get to chapter 10 and I don't want to give everything away, but one night my dog, Max and I, my black lab who passed away last summer after 13 years, he and I wake up one night and we hear this scratching twice and he's a guard dog. So he's standing behind me as I search the house. Right. And we go back to bed. It happens again. We go outside. We look around the next day. I hear all this, it's almost like a chant. And I think my friends are messing with me. I'm out in the garage lifting weights. And it's just like, you were healed. You were healed. And I'm like, where is this coming from? And over the course of the next six months, I started turning my deep brain stimulator down. It was helping me regulate the dopamine in my brain for Parkinson's. And then I turned it off. And she walks out. Two weeks before all this happened, we're in the closet and she grabs my my battery thing and turns it off accidentally and I, I fall into the wall and she turns it back on now two weeks later i turn it off i close my eyes and for the first time in years i do a circle and i was like this is unbelievable she caught me she's like what are you doing i said i turn off my deep brain stimulator she's what <laughs> We call a doctor, we go to the doctor, she does all these physical tests, she goes back and makes me drink all this radioactive fluid so she can MRI my brain and its results come back and she goes, you don't have Parkinson's, this is not real. And I said, what are you? I said, but I'm here. And she goes, I know you're here, but I've never seen this in my career. And, and then my neurosurgeon made me wait a year and then COVID hit. So I, the first elective surgery I've had out of 70 since baseball was last year in July and I had the deep brain stimulator taken out. Now I run and walk every day, five to seven miles. I lift every day and it's just great to have my life back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm going to say this, even if it's not politically appropriate, God is good. God is great. All the time. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's such an amazing, beautiful story. And, just to be so vulnerable and transparent and share that I want to say thank you. Um, we are just about out of time. Let me take just a minute just to remind our listeners, this is the Legacy After the Locker Room podcast. We are powered by Sports Philanthropy Network. Jim, you're doing a lot of work in philanthropy right now. Speaking of sports philanthropy, tell us a little bit about the Jim, the Rookie Morris Foundation, will you please? I was sitting in church one Sunday in 2015 and I had this vision to go out and do something. And the vision that I took was not exactly God's vision. And so that part didn't work out, but what we ended up doing was going into a school in Fort Worth and it started out being Shauna and I, and then my high school kids from Reagan County got involved. And then other people, our friends got involved and then major league baseball got involved and NASCAR got involved. And we went in and we redid the sports fields for the softball and baseball team at this high school in Fort Worth, got them uniforms and got them equipment and got them baseballs for a season and got them a weight room. And then they get to go to a NASCAR race. Kayla, 73% of these kids 
have no home. They're, they're couch jumping or they're staying with a relative that is not one of their parents. And I want these kids back in between the white lines because that's what helped me. And that's what I know. Everybody else has a different something they're really good at that they could help with. Sports is what I'm good at. And we just wanted to go in and do that for these kids. And I had a, um, a Super Bowl champion come in who's about as big as my whole house. And he talked to the kids. I talked to the kids. One of the NASCAR guys came in and talked. And it was just – it got everybody involved over the next couple of years. The Alumni Association got really deep into it again, started planting trees and plants wow. and flowers. Then last year before COVID hits, this baseball team who couldn't even have enough uniforms to field a team and go play, they're 10-0. and 0, And this year they did even better. And so we need to take what is our talent. You know, some people can give money. Money's great. Money always helps. But my talent was sports, and so that's what I can give back, and that's what we've done. And so I, I like to go in and help people get their kids off the street and back onto the field. Well, speaking of getting everyone involved and helping kids and using your talents for good, Jim, Shauna, I ask every guest on Legacy After the Locker Room to partner with me for my charity of choice, Special Olympics. Can we count on you guys for an autograph donation? Absolutely. Absolutely. We love it. Love to. Thank you. Thank you. Any idea what it might be? I'm thinking of baseball, a book, three makers, and a picture of me pitching. I love Autograph. Love you. Autograph. <laughs> Thank you. That's so cool. And speaking of the book, let me put it up here one more time. The book is Dream Makers. Surround yourself with the best to be your best. If people want to get a hold of the book, where's the best place for them to order it? Uh, Amazon, anywhere you order or buy books. And we have a website. If you want it to be autographed, we have a specific website where you can buy the book there at dreammakersbook.com. Dreammakersbook.com. Um, let me remind our listeners, if you want to follow or connect with Jim, he is Jim the Rookie Morris on LinkedIn and Jim the Rookie Morris on Instagram. Shauna, people can find you on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. connect connect with the wives there's a lot of power in that and and the business executive yes. um, let's remind let's remind our listeners you can catch the legacy after the locker room podcast every tuesday night at 8 30 eastern 7 30 central we are just about out of time we have two minutes left i want to give you guys these last two minutes to thank the people you need to thank and give the listeners the viewers your parting words of wisdom I've had certain people in my life who have meant the most to me. The most important one is sitting next to me right now. It'll be 20 years next year. We've raised five kids. Not easy at times because you have a mixed salad. And she did phenomenally. And I got to go out and speak all the time. And now nobody's here and she gets to travel with me. My grandparents, Alice and Ernest Morris, two of the best people I know. Who, by the way, when Dennis... The person who helped us write the book and my wife go, hey, we need to get Dennis to write something for the book. And I'm like, do not bother that man. He's busy. The next thing I know, I'm out walking with my wife one day and my phone, he played me in a movie, right? So we're friends. But when you see Dennis Quaid pop up on your phone, you're like, whoa. <laughs> it's surreal. And he ends up writing this <laughs> this forward for the book. And they, I cried when I read it. I was like, wow. The forward is amazing. And so Dennis, of course, because he's been a great friend for over 20 years. Um, my high school kids from West Texas, Reagan County High School in Big Lake, Texas. There are too many. There are too many to name right now. But when you find those people that you can really trust, you need to gravitate to those people who want to build you up and not tear you down. So for those people who helped me along the way, absolutely thank you so much because it takes a village. Absolutely. I want to thank all of our kids and our uh, daughters-in-law, our new son-in-law. And just because, you know, growing up in the shadow of the rookie is not an easy thing. Growing up period is not easy. So then when you add the shadow of the rookie, you know, it just adds a few more challenges, makes our kids 
had some kids want to be their friends because they could get to him. You know, it's just that sort of thing. And so we love them. Yes. We're so grateful for them, for our grandbaby and for the one on the way in November. So grateful for our parents. We thank our parents for all that they did for us and the support they've given us throughout all the many years of difficult physical issues and whatnot. But yeah. And God, we want to thank God first and foremost. Had it not been for him, I never would have gone back and played. Those mm -hmm. kids pushed me and I now can see God working through them to help me and me to help them. And then there were three different times along the way. And the movie alludes to this, even though you can't really go, hey, this is a Christian movie. There were three different times I was like, God, what do you want me to do? I'm hard headed and I'm stubborn. If you want me to do this, you got to give me if you want me to go home, you got to tell me. And every time something would happen, it would keep me there a little bit longer. And then I end up being in the big leagues, not when I wanted, because if I'd have gotten that dream at 19, I probably would have been a spoiled brat. I get it at 35 after having kids and teaching and coaching kids and knowing what life is about and how hard it really is to get that next opportunity. So I did not take it for granted. That yeah, Hardly ever happens. I'm speechless. <laughs> That's a compliment to you, <laughs> the motivational speaker who leaves me speechless. Um, guys, we are out of time. Um, I didn't know, Jim, your story about Parkinson's and addiction. Yeah. That's a powerful story, and we could have made this easily a six-hour podcast. Oh, yeah. I just want to remind our listeners, if you or someone you know is struggling, reach out find somebody to talk to, anybody to talk to. It's a lot easier when you're not going through battles alone. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just remind our, our listeners and our viewers of that. Um, creating hope and possibility. Holy smokes, you guys are the epitome of that. And mm -hmm. I want to say thank you. Let's just recap this by saying for motivational speaking, reach out to Jim and Shauna. Uh, we can reach Jim the M Rookie Morris on LinkedIn or on Instagram, same handle. Um, again, catch the Legacy After the Locker Room podcast every Tuesday night at 8.30 Eastern, 7.30 Central. And folks, get your hands on the book Dream Makers. Surround yourself with the best to be your best. Chapters 9 and 10, I think I'm going to skip right to them and then I'll go back and read chapters 1 through 8. Shawna, you told me to get the book. I didn't have time. I should have listened. It will be in your inbox tonight. I guarantee you got, you got my vote for ordering. Um, guys, again, thank you so much. Appreciate you being on the show. My name is Kayla Bradham, your host of Legacy After the Locker Room, here tonight with Jim the Rookie and his wife, Shauna Morris, reminding you to live your legacy. Thank you, Jim and Shauna. Thank yes, you so thank much. You. Thank you, Kayla.